So you may wonder what money in banking has to do with uh, bionutrients and uh, a sustainable environment and so, so forth. But to have a sustainable environment, we need a sustainable money system. And uh, the fact that we don't have one is largely, re or in part, responsible for the fact that we have all this degradation in our environment. So I think that everybody sort of feels that. We know we've been captured. We know we had the potential to be more abundant than we are, but we don't really know why. And so, um, so that on, in this first session, I want to just talk about that, about the why. And then tomorrow, I'll talk about sp more specifically about how to fund a Green New Deal or green transition or green uh, revolution, depending on how you want to call it. I know there's a lot of political issues around that. But anyway, to how to uh, get the, the earth back to the state that we all think it should be in. Um, so today I, or today I just want to go over, like, where does money come from? Uh, why do we have this insatiable drive for growth, which has a lot to do with money, and it also has a lot to do with environmental degradation? How did we lose control of our money system, and how can we get it back? So first of all, where does money come from? Um, most, oops. Hmm. most people think it comes from the government. We see the pictures of kings and queens and uh, presidents on our coins and dollar bills. But in fact, very little of it comes from the government, as you can tell from this chart. So the blue line at the bottom is the money that the government creates. So that's coins and dollar bills. And I think it also includes the Federal Reserve, the reserves created by the Fed. So you can argue about whether the Fed even is the government. There's, it's composed of 12 branches, all of which are 100% owned by the banks in their districts. Uh, so anyway, you can see that uh, the red line is M2, the, money, the circulating money supply. So where did all that money come from? Uh, according to the Bank of England, this used to be conspiracy theory, and I first wrote about it in 2007, and I really had to argue hard about it, but now it's accepted. The Bank of England finally came out and said it. This is under pressure from a UK money reform group, Positive Money. So they finally came out and said, contrary to popular belief, banks do not act simply as intermediaries lending out deposits that savers place with them. Commercial banks actually create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. In fact, they said bank deposits actually make up 97% of the amount of money currently in circulation. So that's practically all of it. It's a little less in the US, but still, they make most of the money. So how they do it is by double entry bookkeeping. So if you go to the bank to, let's say you take out a mortgage for $500,000, um, the bank will simply write that number into your account. They don't get the, the money from anywhere. They just write $500,000, and you can now write checks on that account. And when your check goes into another bank, to your seller's bank, it will become a new deposit in the seller's bank. So $500,000 has just been created. Um, at the same time, the bank, so the bank will write that on one side of its books as an asset to itself because you're going to pay that back over time plus interest. And they'll write the same sum on the other side of their books as a liability to themselves because they will have to cover your check when it goes into another bank or when you withdraw the money. So from their point of view, they say, well, if you've got plus, plus 500, minus 500, it all balances. We haven't really created anything. But what they have created is a new deposit when your check leaves the bank. So you might say, well, OK, they have to get the money from somewhere, so maybe they're just creating the money first and then borrowing it later. But they only have to balance their books at the end of the day. And banks have money coming in and going out all day. So if they're lucky, some other bank will also have created a $500,000 mortgage, which will become a check, which will find its way into Bank A. So you might have 500000 coming in and 500000 going out. Again, your book's balanced. You haven't really created anything. But $1 million has just been created that did not exist before. Um, so that sounds bad. You know that most of our money is created by banks. It sounds fraudulent. But if you think about it, it's not really a bad system. It's really the borrower who 
the borrower in partnership with the bank that creates the money. You can't create money, or the bank crea can't create money without a borrower. And if you tried to go to your grocery store or pay your rent or pay your electric bill just by writing out your own IOU, the, the company wouldn't take it, at least in LA where I live, they wouldn't take it. Um, but your bank will take your IOU, they'll turn, it, they'll turn your IOU into a bank's IOU, also known as a bank note or a Federal Reserve note, because they know where to find you, that you're going to fill out a lot of paperwork, you're going to pay them interest, they'll take some collateral, etc. So, so they're protected all different ways and it serves their interest to cover your bet, basically. So they are the guarantor on your loan and behind the banks is the FDIC and the government itself, you know, which will bail out the banks, as we know. So actually, we the people are guaranteeing ourselves in these banks. So really what the bank is doing is turning credit into money. They're turning your promise to pay in the future into something that you can spend today, which, I mean, Benjamin Franklin said that <laughs> hundreds of years ago. That's the basic principle of, of credit and money. So what's really wrong with the system is not that banks create money in partnership with the borrower, but that the banks are private. So uh, when you go through this whole procedure, legally, or when you put your money in the bank, legally, the bank uh, owns the money, and you are just a creditor. So they can do what they will with the money. I mean, we used to have Glass-Steagall, but that got repealed. So they can basically gamble with your with your funds. Um, they can determine who gets loans and, on the, and the terms, and they can refuse to lend. And they actually, it actually serves the banks to not lend because just like um, disease is the, the product of the health system, so debt is the product of the banking system. And so they actually like keeping people a bit in debt because then everybody will have to borrow to, um, to, which serves the banks. So that's the, that's the sort of moral equitable, equitable flaw. But there's also a mathematical problem with this whole system, and that is that banks create the principal, but they don't create the interest. So inevitably, um, debt at interest always goes faster than, than the money supply and then the real economy. There's never enough money to pay back all the debt that's out there. So you can see that from this chart where the red is debt um, of various sorts, household, business, and government, and the green is the money supply, and obviously the red's going up faster. Um, and that is what cre creates the growth imperative. So everybody's always scrambling to find the money to pay off this principal plus interest when only the principal was originally created. And the way the gap is filled, the money just isn't out there. So it means somebody somewhere has to take out more debt. I mean, you might say, well, I didn't go into debt. No, but the money that you earned in your company, somebody went into debt for because that's where money comes from. Uh, and so it's really a pyramid scheme where you have to get more and more borrowers in at the bottom to support the creditors at the top. And inevitably, pyramid schemes at some point collapse. So it's a not a sustainable system. So what we wind up with is called, they euphemistically call the business cycle as if it's like, like the weather, you know, that, well, it's just inevitable that you'll have these credit booms that'll get so big that finally the borrowers are all borrowed up and they can't borrow anymore and then the boom will collapse into a bust. But every time that happens, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer because the people who have money when the bust comes but then buy up all the, the assets at um, distressed prices, and then they rent them back to the people who originally thought they owned them for inflated prices. So, but economists say, well, that's been going on for 2,000 years, ever since the beginning of banking itself, and that's just the way it is. However, oh, and this, so the way it's taught in school is that money and banking evolved from the, all, it was all on the private market. Like you started with barter where you traded cows and corn or whatever in the local market and that was a bit inconvenient. So it was discovered that if you used something that didn't perish, like gold didn't perish, and you could carry it around, so gold became a medium of exchange. And then gold evolved into paper money, which were receipts for gold, which the, 
So the goldsmith would hold the gold and give paper receipts for it. And then that evolved into credit card money and then comp um, computer money where you don't even need credit cards. And then on this chart, it goes to cryptocurrency, but that's the evolution of money on the private market. And that's what people think, where it came from. But in fact, according to Michael Hudson, who's a professor who's written extensively on this subject, money and banking actually appeared 5,500 years ago, and it came into the system full-blown as a public system. It was where it came from, nobody knows. I mean, the Sumerians were the, this is in ancient Sumeria, so they, the, everything was full-blown. I mean, they had the first write, written uh, language, the first wheel, the first irrigation, the first um, seeds that where they genetically manipulated the seeds, so they turned inedible grasses into edible grains, and that's how they fed all these masses of workers that somehow they managed to mobilize to build these amazing structures where nobody knows how they moved the stones and how they how they cut the stones or how they cut how they moved them. So we don't know where it came from, but according to their own literature in the Sumerian cuneiform writings, they um, they actually it, it came from the gods. So so they designed this first this banking system not with money, not with coins. There was no money. It was a credit system, or you know, it was just a keeping track of all these different assets and, or commodities and comparing them to each other. So a certain amount of grain might be worth a certain amount of, they, they actually had beer that you actually paid in beer at the end of the growing season, paid your tab, so you could run up a tab in beer all the way through the growing season until the harvest time. And um, so the lender was the government, which, I mean, it was actually the temple, which was supposedly acting on behalf of the gods, and so this was a religious state. So it, essentially it was a public system, top-down, organized, who knows how or when, but it, but, it came, but it was very efficient, even though they charged interest, quite high interest of 33%, and they still kept this system going for 2,000 years without booms and busts. So how did they do it with, uh, oh, well, so the, so the interest at 33% was actually from the temple. So you were supposed to essentially rent your land and you were supposed to pay, pay a portion of the, of the harvest at the, end of, at the end of the growing season. And if you couldn't, you, were, you weren't kicked off the land, you were allowed to stay, but you had to pay 33% more the next year. And of course, this um, built up over time and people wound up in debtor's prison but it did not serve the king or the temple to have people in prison. They wanted them out in the fields, work in the fields. So periodically, their secret was they just did um, debt jubilees or you know, clean slates where whenever you'd get a new king or you'd win a war or any excuse they thought of, they would just uh, wipe the slate clean, the people could go back, back to their farms and farm again. So that worked for 2,000 years until um, classical Greece and Rome, when that is when our current money system came in, where we had private lenders and uh, all, the, all the hazards of usury that were all in the Bible. Um, so you could not have a debt jubilee to get yourself out of this boom and bust cycle because the, the creditor was no longer the government, it was now individuals who wanted their gold. And also they were lending gold. It wasn't just a credit and debit system, it was actually physical gold and the lenders wanted their gold back. So according to Michael Hudson, uh, debt bondage was actually what led to the fall of Rome. You just had this huge debts that finally took down the economy. Um, then in the Middle Ages, uh, the printing press came into existence and uh, th that was the beginning of paper money. So the gold, at first it was the goldsmiths who would take your gold in for safekeeping and write you a little paper receipt. And people discovered that it was more convenient to trade these paper receipts than and to carry them around than to carry your gold around. So people tended to just leave their gold with the goldsmith. 
and the goldsmiths quickly discovered that they could uh, lend 10 times as many notes as they had gold and get away with it because people just didn't come for their gold. So that was the beginning of what we call fractional reserve lending. And that was also the beginning of bank-created paper money. And then that system was institutionalized with the Bank of England in um, 1694 when William III needed money to fund a war. So he actually borrowed from, from the Bank of England, but borrowed paper bank notes, and the debt never had to be repaid. All that had to be paid on it was the interest. And that is still the system we have today. That $22 trillion that is our federal debt is, can't be paid. It will never be paid. It never is paid. The principal just keeps going up. But it's the interest that must be paid no matter what. The interest is considered one of those non-negotiable expenditures that Congress always has to pay. And it's, uh, I'll show you later with some charts, it's actually the interest that causes the debt to grow up. If you had no interest, you really wouldn't even necessarily have a debt. So you're just adding the extra interest each, each year. Um, then the American colonists came back to the government issued money system. So you have these two competing systems, government issued money versus um, uh, privately issued money, and also two different conceptions of what money is, where the private system sees money as a thing that you have to acquire from somewhere, or somewhere else or dig out of the ground, whereas the public system is more of a credit system. Money is just created as an advance. Uh, in the American colonies in 1691, the governor of Massachusetts was needed money to fund a little border war, and he didn't have anybody to borrow from. So, so he designed the system where he created these little paper receipts and actually paid the soldiers with the little papers, paper receipts. And this was supposedly an, an advance against future payment of taxes. And so it was really, it really was credit and deb debits. They were issuing these credits to people that then didn't, could use them in the payment of taxes. But the problem was these were frontiersmen and it wasn't really easy to collect the taxes. So they did tend to, some of the colonies did tend to overprint and uh, inflated, devalued their currencies. But in Pennsylvania and in several of the middle colonies, they came up with a di different system that was sustainable. And in that system, um, the bills of credit or the paper script was printed by the government and lent to the farmers at 5% interest. And so this is just my little example, but let's say you could print $105, lend $100 at 5% interest, spend the $5 on roads and bridges and whatever else that people needed, and you would have $105 circulating in the money supply. So you would have enough money to pay principal and interest. It would all come back to the government. They could lend this, the 100 all over again, spend the five all over again. And so that was a sustainable system. And during the time that that system was in place, we paid no taxes except for an excise tax on liquor, which was sort of a penalty tax. Uh, there was no, inf the, the money supply did not inflate, or the value of the currency did not, or sorry, the pr prices did not inflate, and uh, there was no government debt. So it was a very sustainable system. What was wrong with it was that the Bank of England didn't like it. It was not the function of the colonies to, uh, to be self-sufficient. They were supposed to be serving the mother country. So the Bank of England leaned on the king, who then forbade that the colonies would issue these these, this paper script, and that caused a depression because the money supply shrank, and that was one of the principal causes of the revolution, American Revolution. Uh, so we won the revolution, but we actually lost the, the power to create our own money because it was funded with these paper receipts called Continentals, which by the end of the end of the war were virtually valueless because there were so many of them. But it was not actually the Continental Congress that had issued all these, the, the excess paper receipts. It was the British who counterfeited the receipts and flooded the market with them as a deliberate war, war tactic. So, but the, the founding fathers were so afraid of this paper money after, after it had collapsed that 
they just left it out of the Constitution. They couldn't agree who should be able to, whether they should have it and who should have it. So the Constitution just says, Congress shall have the power to coin money and regulate the value thereof. And it doesn't say anything about paper money. I mean, some people construe coin money to mean also print money, but it's controversial. However, that meant there was not enough money in the money supply. There was not enough money to fund um, productivity. And we still had some debts left over, like our debt to France was in gold, and we didn't have the gold. So um, Alexander Hamilton in 1791 set up the first US bank, which uh, operated on the Bank of England model, where, or the fractional reserve model, where they took the gold that they did have, and they printed 10 times as many notes in the form of US notes. So we actually had an official paper money supply at that time. And they did pay off the debts. It worked. But the problem was that uh, the bank wound up getting privatized and it got corrupted and Alexander, um, sorry, um, the second bank was shut down. Who shut it down? I forgot. Uh, Jackson, yes, sorry. Andrew Jackson shut down the second, second US bank. And so for a period of time, we had no official currency. We had wildcat banking and another depression hit. So that we had no currency until the Civil War, when uh, Lincoln was faced with war. Uh, civil, he would have to borrow at uh, 26 to 24 to 36 percent interest, I guess. Anyway, exorbitant interest rates, and to avoid that, he went back to the um, paper scrip system of the colonists, where he just issued paper greenbacks, and. He, in, in that, he actually doubled the money supply. So that would be the equivalent today of printing $15 trillion and pumping it into the money supply, which of course everybody would hit the roof and say, you know, hyperinflation. But it did not hyperinflate the system. We, uh, the North won the war, and it, it would, that extra money uh, funded a great deal of productivity, including um, the Transcontinental Railroad, which connected both ends of the country together, uh, very stimulating, and the government turned a 60% 60, 60 profit on the investment of money that was print, just printed in the first place. And the, Ch the Chinese are doing the same thing today, as I will get to later. And you can see from this chart that it wasn't inflationary, that the, the uh, level of the CPI Stay, say the same all the way up till about the 1970s, and I'll say later what happened then. So, however, Lincoln was assassinated, the greenbacks were discontinued, and silver was demonetized. Before that, you could, you'd have paper money that was backed either by silver or gold, and then silver was removed from that backing, and that left only gold. So again, you had a radical shrinking of the money supply and a depression. And that um, triggered the populist movement of the 1890s, which was largely led by farmers who were losing their farms. And so their first effort was to get the government to go back to the greenback system. I actually, that was actually the theme of my book, Web of Debt, that uh, the Wizard of Oz was uh, based on, there was a, the first ever march on Washington was in 1894, uh, it was a, a march of an army of greenbackers who were seeking to get Congress to issue issue greenbacks, but they failed. But anyway, it was it was the farmers, which would be the the scarecrow, and the workers, the out of work workers, who were the, it was the Tin Man. Dorothy was this uh, very fiery greenbacker leader of the time, who had also who had lost her farm in Kansas and was led this movement against the bankers' high interest rates. And the lion was William Jennings Bryan, who was the, um, the populist candidate in 1896 and 1900. He was, called the, he was called cowardly because he didn't want to go to war in the Philippines. Um, so he, <laughs> I had a lot of slides on that, but I thought my PowerPoint was too long, so I left them out. But anyway, it's pretty interesting. Um, so William Jennings Bryan, then, after the greenback push failed, uh, returned to the idea of expanding the money supply with silver, but still he said it had to be the government that issued this money. And uh, in his campaign speech of 1896, he said, 
I, I actually heard him say this, so I know what the, what it, how it sounded like. He said, we say in our platform that we believe that the right to coin money and issue money is a function of government. Those who are opposed to this proposition tell us that the issue of paper money is a function of the bank and that the government ought to go out of the banking business. I stand with Jefferson and tell them as he did that the issue of money is a function of the government and that the banks should go out of the govern governing business. So it was a great speech. <laughs> And he, had, he had, William Jennings Bryan actually supported the Federal Reserve Act because he thought it was so poorly or it was so obscurely written that he thought that, actually, it, that the government actually would now get the power to create its own money. But of course, we know what happened. But the, so the Federal Reserve was passed in 1913. And, um, and instead of the government actually issuing money, which you would think that meant like the colon, what the colonists did would just issue it and spend it, it was the central bank, the Federal Reserve, which is 100% owned by the, it's composed of 12 branches, all of which are 100% owned by the banks in their district. And rather than just handing it over to Congress to spend, the Fed, um, by the Fed lends the money to the government and originally it lent it at interest. And that was the motivation for the, um, for the 16th Amendment, which um, established the income tax, which was supposed to be to pay the interest on this debt. In the 1960s, there was a, a movement to attempt to get the Fed nationalized and to resist that, or to avoid that, the Fed had agreed to re return the interest to the government. So now, now we get our money interest-free from the Fed, but still the Fed has no obligation to buy our bonds. If they do, great. If they don't, then they get sold on the private market. And they have to be sold first on the private market. In the 1930s, the law was changed so that the, the government itself had to sell its bonds on the private market. And if the Fed wanted to buy them, they could or not. It was up to the Fed. So the populist movement failed at the federal level. But in uh, North Dakota, it was very successful. There was a, a movement of uh, farmers who were losing their farms to out-of-state banks. The, the uh, railroad and the banks and the granary were all one system. And so uh, they, the, the granary was not taking their grain, even though it was good grain. There's a movie about this. And when they finally figured out that they were being cheated by this whole system, they got together, formed the nonpartisan league, you know, um, North Dakota is a very conservative state, so they protested anything that sounded socialist and uh, won an election, set up this bank, and that bank has been going for 100 years, and it's very successful. I'll talk more about it tomorrow, but it is our one and only state-owned bank, and it's a highly successful model. So we, at the federal level, failed to get the, recapture the power to create money. But in other former British colonies, including Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, they did have that kind of system where uh, the Canadian Central Bank, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, was formed in 1912. And uh, the head of the governor of the bank knew how banking worked. And when the, the bankers came to him and he said, well, we're, you're gonna have to make, you know, you're gonna have to borrow from us to get started. And he said, well, no, I don't think so. He said, I think we'll just issue the money, which is what they did. They just issued the credit as a bank and um, rebuilt the, did all sorts of development and funded um, Australia's participation in World War I. But he made the mistake of going to the city of London after that and bragging about it. And I guess he died of food poisoning. It's not really clear, but he died shortly thereafter. And after that, the, um, oh, I see I have my slides in a different order, but anyway, I'll, I'll get to that, what happened after that. Uh, so the Bank of Canada, from 1939 to 1974, funded major projects with national credit, including this list, and uh, their universal health care system was set up at that time, just by having the central bank issue the money and the, 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 Treasury borrowed it, but borrowed it interest-free and directly, and then with the proceeds of whatever project they 
did could pay back the loan. Uh, but the Bank of England, again, could not have this. Uh, I mean, again, it was, they had lost the colonies physically, but they wanted to retain control financially by making every borrow, every, all the ex-colonies borrow from them. So a new plan was devised where originally it was supposed to be the Bank, the bank of England that would be the head of this structure where the central banks would, um, there would be a network of central banks that would lend to the government and at the head of the system would be the Bank of England. But after World War I, Bank of uh, England didn't have enough, you know, they were broke after World War I. So that the, man, the baton was passed to the ba uh, Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, which was composed of central banks from four different countries. So that was uh, Germany, Eng or the UK, France, and um, the US. So uh, Professor Carol Quigley uh, was, uh, he was a professor at Georgetown University who was uh, Bill Clinton's mentor when he was there. And he was, he said he was an insider and that he was a librarian for the international bankers. He, he, they were, he was kind of vague about who they were, but he called them the international bankers. And he wrote in his, this very thick book in 1966 that tracked what they were up to called Tragedy and Hope. He wrote, the powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. Each central bank sought to dominate its government by its ability to control treasury loans. So that's the system we have now. We have, there are 55 banks in the Bank for International Settlements, and so these are all the major countries, and the ones that aren't in it are the ones that we tend to find a reason to go to war with. So in 1974, the Basel Committee was formed, and, that, and Canada joined it, and that's what happened to the Canadian economy. That's why they quit borrowing from their central bank. So one of the key objectives of the Basel Committee was to maintain the stability of the currency. And this is still what central banks are all about. That's what they think their job is, to keep, keep a stable money supply so that prices don't go up. And um, the theory was, so that meant that governments couldn't print money and they couldn't borrow directly from their central banks, which created the money, on the theory that that would inflate the money supply. But, and that banks, unlike the government, would be, were lending existing money. But in fact, as we know, the banks were actually uh, creating money just like, just like the governments would have been and should have been. So this, this, that screenshot is from a, this great video, this little French video. <laughs> it's in French, but it's an excellent little video that um, the effect was to turn the money tap off where the money was coming from the government and turn the tap on where the money's coming from the banks at interest, of course. And so this led to these, this big credit bubble, especially with the um, deregulation and liberalization of the laws that pretty much let the banks do whatever they wanted and which led up to the 2008 crisis eventually. So in 1974, the Canadian government quit borrowing from its own bank and by 2006, the government had paid over twice its debt just in interest. So you can see from this chart that if it hadn't had to do that, it would, the debt would have remained virtually stable. So it would have had almost no debt. And in France, you could see it would, it would have actually literally had no debt. Its debt increased by 1.35 billion from 1973 to 2010, and it paid 1.4 billion in interest. So if it, if it hadn't had to pay that interest, it would have had no debt. So the debt itself is not a problem. The problem is the interest, and the interest, of course, goes to bondholders or to banks that ultimately create, create all that money. So without interest, there might not be the, any federal debt. So it would be just like in 17th century England where all we are paying is the interest. That's all we're paying today. And you can see from these charts the one on the left is the federal debt, 
and the one on the right is the interest, they both are going up exponentially, and it's from the interest. So most people uh, left all this to the Federal Reserve right up till 2008. Like, we figured it was t too obscure and too boring for us really to understand, and um, things were going along well. We thought of the Fed as, the, the Fed was sometimes called the temple, so it was basically like the temple of the Sumerians, you know, that it was in charge of the banking system until 2008, and then we, 2008, 2009, and then globally we had a disastrous economic collapse. Just in the U.S., nine million jobs were lost, six million foreclosures happened, and eight trillion was lost in the stock market. And after that, um, all, <laughs> after that, uh, um, Alan Greenspan and Janet Yellen and um, Ben Bernanke, the, the next three uh, heads of the Fed, all said that they didn't see it coming. So how is that possible? I mean, I saw it coming, and I, you know, I was, I'm just a writer. I was just co quoting other people. So a lot of people saw it coming. So what did they miss? And clearly, there's something wrong with their with their economic theories. So here are six that I think are significant. Uh, the one that, um, that uh, um, I don't know why I can never get think of his name. The one that um, Alan Greenspan admitted to was that markets self-correct, you know, that you can just, you can, everybody can just follow their own self-interest and it'll all, all come out, it'll all work out. And the, and the fact that wealth trickles down, that uh, you, it doesn't matter if the rich are getting richer because a rising tide lifts all boats and everybody will get richer. And then there's the, the one about that banks are just intermediaries. So they're, they're basically left out of, the, even today, they're left out of economic formulas because the economists say, well, it doesn't really matter how much debt we have because one person's debt is another person's credit. In other words, if you borrow some money, then the saver doesn't have it, but then the borrower has it. So it's the same money going into the economy. But we now know that that's not true. If you borrow from a bank, you are actually creating new money. New money is going into the system, and it's definitely affecting things in general. So it needs to be factored in. Uh, another is that booms and busts are just part of the system, like the weather, a natural phenomenon, uh, that government money printing just leads to price inflation. So we can't fix it, in other words. You, you can't put more money out there. And that if, even if you could fix it, if you could put more money out there, you're still limited by, you can only do it up to full employment. And in theory, we're already at full employment, but we're really not, as I will show. So myth number one, greed is good. The invisible hand of the market will self-correct. Uh, clearly, that's not true. In the 19th century, every six years on average, I read one place there, we had a banking crisis right up until the Fed, which in 1913 was supposed to fix that by providing the gold to backstop these banks on the gold system. And, and that clearly didn't work because then we had the biggest bank run ever in 1929 all the way up to 1933 the banks were collapsing until the federal government intervened with the by Roosevelt took the dollar off the gold standard and Congress passed the Glass-Steagall Act the part that most people think of as Glass-Steagall was that Congress separated investment banking from depository banking so they couldn't gamble with our deposits but the part that was more significant was, I think, was the FDIC insurance was part of the Glass-Steagall Act. So the deal was, okay, we'll insure the deposits up to $100,000 at that time, but you can't gamble with them. You've, you know, you've got a separation between deposits and investments. And then later, the banks managed to get around that, and so Glass that part of Glass-Steagall was repealed but we the people are still on the hook for FDIC insurance. So now we are insuring our deposits in banks that can gamble with them and pretty much do what they will with them. And, uh, and we're the ones that, we're, we're underwriting this whole system of gambling by big banks. So then we had the subprime collapse. Uh, and again, the government had to come to the rescue with bailouts, Dodd-Frank, 
bail-ins, where that's the new thing under Dodd-Frank, that they will actually take our money first before, or they'll take the money of the creditors of the bank before they can get a government bailout. That, however, hasn't worked. It's been tried in Europe and has virtually led to revolutions. Quantitative easing and zero interest rate policy. So clearly the visible, invisible hand of government, of the market doesn't work, you need the visible hand of government in there. Money is a public system and it has to be a public system and it has to be regulated on behalf of the people and the economy. Myth number two, wealth accumulation is benign, a rising tide lifts all boats. You can see from this chart that's not true. The, the rich are getting richer, but they're getting richer at the expense of the poor. The poor are getting poorer overall. And then uh, Thomas Piketty showed in his bestseller, Capital of the 21st Century, that this was quite dangerous, that as at some point, the disparity between rich and poor leads to a collapse. And the, so this first thing on the left is, um, was a 1929 collapse, and you can see that we have the same gap today, or actually even a little larger gap, between rich and poor, so we're headed for another collapse. And you can also see from this chart that it's the financial sector that's the guilty party. Uh, the red line is the non-financial sector. Their income is not going up much at all, and the thing that has shot up is the financial sector. That's the blue line on the top. Myth number three, banks are just intermediaries, so I've already gone through that money is created by the government. Uh, the facts were said very well by Robert Hemphill, credit manager of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta in 1934. He wrote, we are completely dependent on the commercial banks. Someone has to borrow every dollar we have in circulation, cash or credit. If the banks create ample synthetic money, we are prosperous. If not, we starve. Excuse me. Myth number four, the business cycle is unavoidable. Um, we've seen that in fact it can be fixed with a debt jubilee. And there is quite a bit of, there are movements right now for debt jubilees. But the problem is you can't really forgive the debt of, if the creditor is private parties. So, but there is another alternative, and this was suggested by Ben Bernanke in 2002 when he was advising the Japanese. He said it's easy to fix a debt deflation, which means where the money supply is shrinking because people are, they, they're so, they're all borrowed up. So they can't take out more debt and they're paying down their debt. And when debt is paid down, money, money collapses, money disappears. So you've got to have somebody taking out more debt to keep the system sustainable. So he said, this is, it's easy. He actually got this from Milton Friedman. Just fly helicopters over the people and drop money on them. You know, just put some extra money out there to fill the gap. But everybody made fun of that because of what I would call myth number six, the quantity theory of money, that, um, that if you increase demand, like you pump more money into the system, you'll just have too much money chasing too few goods and so prices will just go up without actually creating any productivity. And that would certainly be true if supply were fixed. But it isn't, and it need, needn't be. If the money goes into productive pursuits, such as the greenbacks that went into building the Continental Railroad, uh, Transcontinental Rail Railroad, then um, you, you will have supply and demand go up together, and so prices will remain stable. So this is just my little chart. If you have like $100 chasing 100 wid widgets, the market will put, set the price at a dollar. If you have $1,000 chasing 100 widgets, it will drive the price up to $10. But if you have $1,000 chasing 1,000 widgets, the price will still be a dollar. So you just have to put your money to productive use and you can avoid prices going up. And for today, our best example is China. China actually increased their money supply by 1,800% in the last 23 years. They, so that means by 18 times, uh, Lincoln doubled the money supply. China has increased it 
18 times. So that should cr create massive hyperinflation in theory, but it didn't. The bottom line here is, the top line is the money supply. The bottom line is the um, consumer price index, which has remained relatively stable. You can see there's some little blips, but right now it's all the way back to where it was in 1998, right around 2%. So how did they do it? It's because their GDP shot up at the same rate. So they were putting all that money into productivity. Supply and demand went up together. And there's, there are other factors in there, and I'll get to that tomorrow. But, so, and, but, and then so the economists say, well, all right, all right, you could put some money in as long as you do use it for productivity. But uh, that only works up to full employment, because once you hit full employment, then you'll run out of workers, and so you can't make more goods. And th that's a limiting factor. And they say we're there today. But you can, first of all, that's called the Phillips curve, and I don't know if you can tell from this, but the Phillips curve is very <laughs> un uncertain. I mean, sometimes it's together, sometimes it's not. It doesn't match very well. And according to uh, John Williams of shadowstats.com, real unemployment is actually at 22% because the official numbers aren't factoring in, like the people that gave up looking for work, like maybe they're over 50 and nobody wants to hire people that, because of all the benefits they'll have to pay, except, et cetera. Or they're just, you know, can't find work that they're qualified for or whatever. They hate their jobs, that kind of stuff. Um, but besides that, not even counting whether we're at full, full employment, uh, not all the money that you would pump into the money supply, let's say you did do a um, helicopter money like a universal basic income or national dividend where everybody got maybe $1,000 a month, people are not going to run out and spend that money on trinkets. You probably, well, the Chinese are big savers, so as their incomes went up, their, the amount, the percentage that they spent on GDP went down. So you can see in these charts. So that helped balance out the, out the prices. And in the US, you've probably seen these figures that 40% of the population can't come up with $400 in an emergency. Now, if you're in that category, you are not going to run out and spend your windfall that you, finally, that you suddenly got on another watch or another hat or something like that. You're definitely going to save it because you desperately need savings. And if you use that money to pay down debt, um, the money will be extinguished along with the debt. That's the way the money supply works. So um, if, you add, if you take out loans, the money supply increases. If you pay back debt, the money supply shrinks. So that money is not going to inflate prices either. It's not going to go into this consumer price index. And uh, household or debt. Household debt is higher now than it's ever been. So again, you could, you, if you wanted to do a universal basic income, you can make it automatic that it paid, paid down debt. Like you could make it, the, your bank knows what you owe. So it could just go right into your bank account every month and it would go to pay off your credit card or your student loan or whatever. It would go toward your debts. And if you didn't have any debts, those people probably aren't going to rush out and spend it either because they've already got enough money. They've already spent on what they need. They're probably going to save it somewhere, invest it somewhere. It might go in the stock market. It might drive up the stock market. But that doesn't hurt anything. The stock market is just a big casino. And if it goes up and up, that's good, whatever. Uh, so that's not going to go into the consumer price index either. So there is plenty of room for helicopter money from the central bank for all those things we think we need, including the infrastructure that we desperately need and we can't seem to find the money for, although the Chinese managed to create you know, 12,000 miles of high-speed rail in 10 years. How did they do it? They just issued the credit. They own their own banks, most of the banks. Issued the credit, built the thing, and then the fees from the thing paid back the loans. We could do that too. Uh, we could fund a Green New Deal or Green Transition, whatever you want to call it, without getting into the politics of whether the Green New Deal is a good idea. I mean, we definitely think we want regenerative agriculture, which is part of the Green New Deal. Uh, we could fund a universal basic income a national or a national dividend, universal health care, student debt relief. We could even, I would argue, pay off the federal debt, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be inflationary. Why? Because 
our debt is held by bondholders. You could pay it off by having the Fed just print the money, move the money. So you move the bonds into the, into the account of the Federal Reserve. The Japanese, the Bank of Japan, currently owns 50% of the Japanese debt. And they, don't, they have a deflation problem. They can't even get their, their consumer price index up to 2%, which is what they're aiming for. So anyway, there's many possibilities uh, just by using the credit power that should be ours. But the first thing we have to do is to actually nationalize the Fed, like get the Fed back as a public utility that's designed to serve the public and that's under the control and ownership of the public. So those are my three books on this subject, Public Bank Solution, Banking and the People is my latest book, and Web of Debt. And, uh, or you can, if you want more information, you can go to my website at ellenbrown.com or publicbankinginstitute.org. And if I went too fast, uh, you can write me an email. <laughs> and I'm happy to, uh, to uh, send my PowerPoint. So I guess I have time for questions. <laughs> Okay, well, there are two kinds of inflation, and that's where people get confused, that if you inflate the money supply, like you add money to the money supply, the thought is that because you're going to have all this extra money chasing the same amount of goods, that's going to inflate the uh, consumer, consumer price index, but it doesn't, it, for all those reasons I just explained. So, so inflating the money supply means printing extra money or getting, or printing it, you know, just taking out more credit will inflate the money supply because money is created by banks when they, when they make loans. Uh, so, but that's a different thing from the, the prices going up, which either might happen if you have a limited supply, like housing in New York, for example. Everybody wants a house in New York, so the prices will go up because there's a limited supply or shortages of various sorts, or manipulation often causes inflation. But if you want to know if there's inflation because the money supply has increased, you would have to look at the inflation rate all across the board. Like, OK. Yeah. Uh, well, because I, I'm actually an optimist, not because, you know, every, I think everything's going well, but I think because everything's going so poorly that um, it's, it's, the system is ripe for change. You've got central bankers who are saying that, that it's, we've got to do a reset, that it's not working the way it is now. I mean, of course, we don't like what they're proposing, but they're looking for ideas. It's just like, I would say some things in the Green New Deal I don't agree with, but the fact that it's now out there as something we must deal with, then it gives us an opportunity to say, I don't think what you're proposing from Silicon Valley is gonna work, but here's something that will work. You know, Let's redo the whole, let's regenerate our soils and that will work. So anyway, I think it's an opening to change things, so in that sense, it's good. I mean, in terms of your investments, I never try to advise on that. I don't even really know. You know, I just stick with my same old stuff. But, um. What about the growth chance? Is it Okay, well, by definition, you can't do it to infinity, but you could do quantitative easing. You could have a computer program. I saw a very good discussion of how you would set it up. Of, you know, we have five trillion dollars in uh, five trillion dollars are traded every day, U.S. dollars, and uh, most of those trades are not taxed. So this was a discussion of how you would how you would do a financial transaction tax. So let's say you had a financial transaction tax of. 0.1% on everything. Right now in California, we pay 10% on shoes and school bags and you know all those things that we do need, and there's n nobody pays on most of those trades. So, uh, why don't, so, so he, this writer, his last name was Scott Smith, is his name. He said that uh, you could have a computer program that would be like a thermostat, and so you could actually adjust that 0.1 
you know, you just see, if you see that prices are going up across the board, not just in certain sectors where there's shortages, then you could just raise the tax a little bit and the tax would bring money back. And in fact, he said, you don't even need to send the, mo the money off to the treasury. You could, it could just disappear. You know, it's just a thermostat. When there's too much, then you shrink it a little bit by shaving some off. No, a gold standard is, I didn't do it tomorrow, I was going to get into this more, but you know what, you know this whole repo thing where, uh, was it 164 billion, I forget, 54 billion, something. So the Fed just pumped 154 billion into the repo market because JP Morgan pulled 154 billion of their reserves out of the market. Well, the repo market is this overnight market. So banks have to go in and make their books balance, but they only overnight. So they borrow this money overnight and give it back in the morning. So it's a total fraud. It's like, you've got it in the day and we'll have it in the night and everything works out. So we're, we're pretending that money is a thing and that you've got to get it from somewhere. But what I've written about in um, Banking on the People, my latest book, is that it, we have a wrong conception about money. Let's just acknowledge that it's just credit. It's just, and you could tap, uh, you could use the central bank as your deep pocket, or you're just turning your own credit into money. That's what, that's what money is. And if you had a few um, defaults, oh well, you just add a little to the money supply, like the Chinese do. They don't, they don't put businesses into, into bankruptcy or banks into bankruptcy when they have defaults. Where everybody complains they've got all these non-performing loans, but it's good for the economy to get more money out there. So. Gold standard was, obviously it didn't work. That's why we had the 1929 crash and then Nick Nixon had to take the dollar off the gold standard because uh, France, for one, de Gaulle was clever enough to pull his gold out and I think he took a third of our gold in one move and then the British were gonna take their gold out. I mean, we didn't have enough gold, there's a point. It works as long as nobody takes their gold. But if everybody wants their gold back, that's what causes runs on the banks. <laughs> It's almost like money is an agreement deal. And so the reason that it worked well for China to do what they did is because they had the right configuration of relationships setting up the agreements that they were going to operate from. And in this country right now, those people who are setting up the agreements that we're operating our money system from are not doing so in our best interest. But that's why it's so easy to switch because it's just an agreement deal. Once every money is a tool, it's energy, it's flow. Yeah. Value. So once people agree on how they're going to move that value around, then of course it can happen because we've done that pretty much everything under the sun at this point. The streets will be Right. Money is a flow, and everything that flows is, should be a public utility. Water, electricity, money. There's one other that I'm not thinking of, but yeah. Oh, transportation, like roads. You said that the federal debt does not move to the Federal Reserve Bank. The bond Who the bond uh, well, if you look at a chart, it's, they break the chart up. And I think what you probably know, how much is the Fed? Oh, maybe 10%? Oh, yeah, well, that, but that's the Treasury. Pension, uh, the um, Social Security owes a big chunk, I think 40% of it is owned by government funds, not counting the Fed, because the Fed doesn't count itself part as, as part of the government. So they're in a separate t category. I think the last time I looked, it was 12% or something. And then you've got the Chinese at, and the Japanese at a couple trillion between them. Okay. Yeah. And then individuals own a lot of it, but not by the Federal Reserve. Yeah. But it should. I think the, the Fed should buy it and not give it back and just keep rolling it over interest-free. Um, yes, Dan. So, uh, about a month and a half, two months ago, Mark Harding, the current governor of the Bank of England, announced that the U.S. dollar needs to no longer be used as a uh, world reserve currency. It should now be replaced by a hegemonic uh, digital currency. Since then, those world banks have announced the development of crypto-type uh, currencies to replace their current native currencies in the coming years. Mm -hmm. The Federal Reserve announcing that ours will be available sometime in the 2023-2024 time period. So given that information, I think that we can all see 
two things, right? The currency reset is actually occurring worldwide. Secondly, if the US dollar is replaced with the world reserve currency, that means the trillions and trillions and trillions of US dollars are currently overseas will come flooding back into this market, destroying our current rate of inflation the monetary system coming here. Um, how do you see any of all this playing out? Am I wrong in my insight on part of this? And how are cryptocurrencies part of that particular ripple, which is the only cryptocurrency uh, corporation that was invited to the G20 summit and somehow appears to be uh, backing this thing? Sorry, who is the only country? Ripple. Ripple. Oh, oh, right, yeah. Ripple's a good system, I think. I mean, it's a, you know, it's not a, it's not a blockchain. It's a, it's just a more efficient, no, I don't think so. It's a. They have some, they have some products. XRP is the, their blockchain model, and their products are um, potentially replacing the SWIFT system yeah and then we'll then use but it's not a blockchain in the sense that you've got a block that tracks every single trade it can't be I mean the banks don't won't use that that's my understanding I, I'm not I'm not saying what the banks will or won't use I'm just they're using ripple though that's coming out I, I, I have investment in XRP it is a blockchain okay well we can talk I think it's a semantic thing that they that you know, blockchain is being used as a term, although. But anyway, I agree that like the countries are going to digital currency. I think it's a good thing if the U.S. dollar were to go digital, because right now the only dollars that are out there are paper dollars, and that's all we have access to. Like you've got this reserve currency that sits at the Fed, but we have no access to it. Only the banks can use that reserve currency. If you had a digital currency, basically, what you're do that the government is, well, I mean, I do think the first thing we have to do is nationalize the Fed or take it back as a public utility. But assuming it were serving the public interest, um, it means that the government is issuing more of the currency. Now, the big concern, if they open, the, the proposals are that the Fed would open its deposit window to individual depositors. And this would prevent bank runs. You've got the deep pocket. You don't have to worry about your bank going bankrupt. But that and and they're paying two percent interest or like whatever one one at one point eight or whatever they're at now, on excess reserves to the banks for just letting like basically our reserves which are our deposits sitting there, in their in the Fed. So if they paid us that, which they can pay whatever they want because they're a deep pocket, we could be getting one point eight percent interest in a bank that can't go bankrupt, and so. Um, was that a signal? Am I over time? No. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, so we could, um, everybody would pull their money out of the regular banks and into the Fed. That's the big concern with that, with that fail-safe system. And then what, what money would there be to lend? That's the big argument. But it seems to me that, so I'll talk tomorrow about setting up a national public banking system. What, that's what you want to do. You want to have a national public banking system with the Fed at the head. The, the public banks would be making the loans, dealing with their local, you know, they would know you, they would know the customer because they're local, and, but they would have the, the deep pocket of the Federal Reserve to draw from. So anyway, I think it's a positive development. I don't like Mark Carney's proposal that, um, that it would be the central banks that control. Well, Mark Carney said that the central banks and the governments need to work together, right? So, in other words, so like the Japanese do, where the, where it's actually in their banking laws that the that the Ministry of Finance is supposed to work with the Bank of Japan, and so they get together, and the Ministry of Finance says, "Well, we want to, we're going to do this development program of whatever type, and we want you to buy the bonds. We're going to fund it with bonds, and you buy them, and the Bank of Japan does it. So that's what." That's, that's a good thing, I think, but the way Mark Carney proposed it, unless I'm thinking of a different proposal, I get them confused, was that um, it would be overseen by independent, um, well, it'd be like those, those appointed people in Europe, the, the, the Eurocrats, you know, that, um, that oversaw the ECB programs. In other words, it would be the central bank determining, determining where the money goes and not Congress. It seems to me it's got to be Congress that 
But, but the, all that is promising. There's potential. As for getting rid of the dollar as reserve currency, I've read, but I'm not sure I can formulate this properly, but that the Chinese are not going to, I mean, how would they flood the market with dollars? What are they going to do with them? What are they going to buy with them? The reason the Chinese are holding all those dollars is because we have bought their products and we gave them dollars. And so the government gave them a place to put them, like, okay, if we're going to make our bonds available to you. So now what are they, what are, where are they going to spend them? So I don't, I don't think they'd come flooding back. Maybe there'd be, you know, some balancing over time, but I don't see it like crashing the dollar all of a sudden. Can you answer that? <laughs> uh, a question, when the overnight repo thing gets to the point that it's greater than the 800 billion of the 20, uh, 2008, uh, Bailout, is that more likely to cause negative interest rates? And if we have negative interest rates, would that cause a bank run? Because people say, hey, I'm losing money in the bank, I might as well pull it off. I don't think we'll ever go to negative interest rates. The, the reason Europe went to negative interest rates was to keep Italy from leaving um, because. Italy, Italy didn't have the option of having its own central bank, and so, and you know, Italy got. Do you have a solution? <laughs> Sorry, this is my friend Kristen, who's an investment investment advisor at Merrill Lynch, and knows a lot of this stuff too. <laughs> they, they would want that to some degree. So I mean, that, that if, if we do go to negative rates like they did in Denmark, or in the summer, it just would facilitate further investment, other other investment. One problem, one problem is that all our derivatives, or we've got $500 trillion in derivatives in U.S. dollars. And if we went to negative interest rates, that means that the banks that were on, the, you know, these are, there's parties on each side of the trade. That they'd, it, like you have, um, you hedge your bet by betting this way on some things and that way on other things. But if you went to negative interest rates, you'd be holding the bag on both sides, and it would wipe out the banks. So it's just not going to happen. That's my opinion. Are, are there reserve requirements, effective reserve requirements anymore, or those gone by the Where the bank has to have a certain percentage of deposit relative to loan. They used to have to have money on deposit. Yeah. Um, they do, but you know, deposits from where they buy their second. There's, um, the, I've forgotten the term, but anyway, they're, they're deposits that you borrow from other banks, and you borrow them overnight to to meet your requirement. If if you're a small startup bank, you should have probably should have, um, in like only eighty. You should have loans only up to the extent of about eighty percent of your deposits. But if you're J.P. Morgan, you can pretty much do what you want because they can get the liquidity somewhere else. It doesn't have to be their own deposits. That, but they do have a huge. They have more deposits than anybody else in the world. I think their deposit base is huge. So, so it, there is technically still a reserve requirement, but. Banks can get around it. They don't necessarily have to have all that in the form of their own deposits. And some countries have no no reserve requirement. Yes. Thank you for your research. Your work is excellent, and thank you for your optimism. My heart is with that. <laughs> and my question was going back into the historical records. Um, you mentioned really, like I think it was your second or third slide, um, that the Bible had usury laws in the Bible that prevented the types of banking that we have today, uh, or at least that it shouldn't exist. I think the Quran did too, and I just wanted to say that out loud because when we have this revolution, it's all of us. Yeah, oh yeah. Now, well, in, in both cases, they were just like moral prescriptions. There was nobody who could actually enforce it, and that's, yeah. Now, I mean, we need a system that's enforceable where you really can't cheat because the system's set up that way. That's what I think. It's not really the people. You're always going to find, you know, if you've got rat holes, rats are going to come through. So you've got to have a system where you seal up all the holes and people can't cheat. Did you, was there more? Yeah, the Sharia law has like zero interest code in it. 
Um, and I learned about this by, by facilitating a bunch of business development in the Muslim community in Lewis and Maine. And some of the challenges that the new influx of Muslim folks from Somalia are having is that they can't acquire real estate if they're really religious because they can't take on interest. And so one day I was just listening to a personal story and I thought about the global financial system and how many of the geopolitical conflicts might be, and, and some of our xenophobia um, propaganda could be actually banks fighting with religious Muslims who have nothing to do with them. Totally. I think all wars are bankers' wars. <laughs> Somebody said that, but I agree with that. Okay, there was that one over here. No, I know nothing about banking. I really don't know anything about the macro economy, except that a lot of people fall off the edge. And I've been looking at the development of local currencies, time banks, barter systems, and so forth. So that ordinary people in ordinary communities on a day to day in a day to day life can get done what they need to have done. And I'm wondering where those ideas fit into this larger scheme, if they do at all. Well, the problem with community currencies is you're very limited in the, I mean, it's based on the trust of the community. There's no backup. Um, so what I've actually written about in Banking on the People, I think we could have a national community currency system. I mean, I think that's what we've got, a, a system in which money is created by the users. It's created as a debit and a credit, and it's extinguished when the, when the, debit is paid off, and that is that is what a community currency system is. Here's what I would envision. Oh, one thing you could do with the deep pocket of the Fed, if we could nationalize it, um, Switzerland and Japan are actually buying stock on the stock market. So we could buy Amazon, let's say. So I would picture, could picture this big market like Amazon or eBay that is publicly owned, you can sell your goods into the market and get credit in the form of the national community currency and then use that to, to buy things that you want to buy. I mean, because, because of digital, be, well, I think the thing that makes Amazon reliable is that is all the reviews. So if you've got 100 people that give it all of five stars, then you trust it even though you don't know this person personally. Whereas in a regular community currency, you, I, my daughter researched this and said that the limit of the people that you can trust is 1,500 people, you know, people that you know that know people that, so you can actually trust them as good pays when you don't have a backup. And one advantage of the system we have now is like if you buy something with a credit card, you can cancel the payment. I mean, you've got an alternative if what you get is not what you, what you ordered, and Amazon will do that too. But we could have a public system like that with that, that sort of backup that would be in the nature of a community currency. You're not borrowing, you're actually creating your own currency by selling something into the market and vice versa. Yes, in red. Um, the ancient Sumerians created the concept of money in the form of tokens. And if you want to see what they look like, they're the Museum of Natural History. But basically, they're a metaphorical form. They don't, it, it's a time-based metaphorical form so that you can go to someone who's growing wheat and you have some chickens who could be eaten today. So you give the wheat grower uh, your chicken and the wheat grower gives you little stones with the imprint of wheat on them, like a picture that you can come back at the wheat harvest and present and then you could get the wheat that you are trading for that chicken that you gave earlier. There's an element of trust and the, and the token was something that evolved into what we consider to be money. Um, yeah, well, I, the way I saw it, it, these were like cylinders that had the little tokens in them. Yeah. And then they turned, the, turned that into these black cuneiform figures, you know, that represented the thing. So then you would, oh, I guess you would, first you would put on the outside of your cylinder what you had in it, so you didn't have to unseal it to see what was in there. So they marked them with these symbols that meant goat and sheep and corn or whatever it was. Okay. Yeah, and then it, and then they got rid of the tubes and just, it was just the symbols that were, were, um, you know, an accounting system, just an accounting system. You brought in so many goats and you took out so many sheep or whatever. Yeah. But that inspired our family, being farmers, to kind of think about money differently because 
Millie, who's a farmer, makes a whole lot of money, really, that I know, uh, at the family farm level. So from the earliest days of our family, we have functioned on the barter system. Our farm originally, long ago, uh, before we got into bench cropping, grew horticultural material. And the farm is nestled in the suburbs. Everybody needs landscape material. And so we built our house on barter. Uh, and Martin Jaffe, who has a telephone company, needed more and more plants for his landscape, so we have a telephone system that would uh, satisfy a small corporation because the more plants he needed, the more telephones we got in, <laughs> in trade. Um, I, we, we never pay for dentistry because we trade with the dentist. I've never paid for guitar repair because Joseph Giselli loves my vegetables. I come with a basket of vegetables and he fixes my guitar. <laughs> um, we've learned that um, if you give the fellow down at All Weather Tires vegetables a lot and then get him into growing his own vegetables and now I give him seedlings, we don't have to pay top prices for tires because we always get a good <coughs> deal. We have developed relationships through our agriculture because people need things that we pay, whether they're vegetables or trees. And building those kinds of currencies has allowed us to live a very, very nice lifestyle. It's, it's not what everybody does, but I think if one takes a look at resources and expands the definition of resources to think about what it is that you can contribute, then you have the basis for the ancient form of money. It is it's an energy exchange. And it's, it's just something to think about. What do you have that you could trade? Mm -hmm. The only, it seems to me that what you need banks for is stuff like a mortgage. You know, you just don't have anything worth $500,000 that you're going to trade. So you do have to take out credit and pay it over time. And so that type of money is your future promise to repay. Like, and even in Islamic banking, for example, you, you know, they, they've never really figured out how to do Islamic banking. I was in Malaysia four different times giving presentations. and. They're, they're, so what they do is they say, well, okay, it's $500,000, or it's $250,000 if you pay up front in cash. If you extend it over 30 years, it's $500,000. So that's how they get around it. Yeah. To nationalize the Fed or to restructure it, will it require the legislative branch, or is there any executive branch to do it? Can you get it all? Um, there, the executive branch could, there are some executive, or, I mean, I've written about the executive, the, the president could issue a trillion dollar coin as an executive order because he's in charge of the treasury and the treasury is in charge of coinage. Um, but, and you know, there was talk of that when we were, had the problem of the debt. See, I actually originated that idea. It was in my book, Web of Debt, but I, I yeah, anyway. Um, but I don't. But for actually restructuring the Fed, that would be up to Congress. It's Congress that. But you know, the, in the 2010 Dodd Frank Act, they changed the Federal Reserve Act. They do it routinely, like just little tweaks here and there. But you could just tweak it so that the Fed was allowed to make zero interest loans to states, for example. You know, Obama said at the time he said, "Well, since you're making zero interest loans to banks, what about making them to the states?" and Uh, ben Bernanke said, well, we can't do it because it's not in the Federal Reserve Act. So fix the act. Congress has the power. Yeah. You know, I'd like to ask you about what you think really caused inflation and it wasn't the, gold, the lack of gold standard. In our lifetime, we've seen gasoline go up from like 35 cents to $4 in California. So, and other, I would say, even when they were You remember 35 cents. Real necessities have totally gone up like 10 through 50 times mm -hmm. in 60-something years. Yeah, well, in 1971, you know, the dollar was taken off the gold standard because we didn't have the gold. And that's what Nixon said, sorry, you know, we're out, we're closing the window. Um, but then the dollar plummeted, and so supposedly, this was in a book by William Engdahl, um, Henry Kissinger and Nixon met with uh, the OPEC countries Um, and made a deal. They said, we're going to quadruple the price of oil, but in re and in return, you will 
sell your oil only to uh, only in U.S. dollars, and you'll put the dollars in our bank, the, in either Wall Street banks or in uh, like the euro dollars would go into the London, the the Bank of England, or the London banks. Sorry, the ba London banks, City of London. So that was the deal, and then we had this little nine-day war that, you know, in, in the Middle East that drove up, the that quadrupled the price of oil. It actually happened. But apparently that was the plan. And so all the countries that didn't naturally have oil, they thought they had the reserves they needed, but suddenly they had to borrow, and they had to borrow in dollars. So that put them in debt, and, you know, so that just started this whole debt syndrome. And that was the same time, like Canada's this debt went up and France's debt went up, all these countries, because they couldn't borrow from their own central banks. At the, so that happened at the same time in 1974. And then apparently, you know, there were other factors that I've read and I can't even remember now. Um, one was that we were anticipating inflation and therefore the Fed raised interest rates on the theory that this was going to prevent inflation because people wouldn't borrow because interest was higher. But you know what it means, people, they, people have, businesses have to borrow. They run on a credit line. And so if interest rates go up, they just have to raise their prices to cover, cover the cost. And another was the fact that we had a big, there was a big, um, um, the credit, or the, sorry, the unions were very strong, you know, and at that time they were de demanding more wages as well. So you had, you had all these things going on at once. But it was not because governments were printing money or because they were borrowing from their central banks. Because that had been, like in Canada, that had been going on for 35 years. And if you look at the inflation rate, it was quite stable. Okay, so, so I, what I want to go through first is that um, like the Green New Deal has a lot of social welfare stuff that everybody says is outrageously expensive, but then I, I'll show that we can actually afford it. And uh, the things that actually have to do with the environment, um, well, that, uh, you know, fixing the transportation system, fixing the buildings, et cetera, are not, it'll be outrageously expensive. It'll, we'll get, have a revolution on our hands if we try to make everybody switch over to Priuses, like happened in France with the yellow jackets. They just, or the yellow vest, they just can't afford it. You know, people, truckers can't go out and buy another truck just because, and it won't work to raise gas prices because that's what happened in France. And it will, um, you know, changing the buildings over, th those are all good ideas and maybe they should happen over time. But what would really fix the system is obviously the agricultural, regenerative agriculture and how much would that cost. And so I'll go into all that and how we can fund it. So there's more focused on the, on the Green New Deal thing. And public banking, and local public banks. So the um, Bank of North Dakota model, and we now have a pretty big movement going of, uh, in, in California, AB 57 was just signed by the governor, which sets out a special charter for a publicly owned bank. Um, and they're advocates in 10 different cities in California that are now competing to be the first to get their public bank up. And we've got um, 25 active bills across the country. In New Jersey, the governor just this week uh, announced or that he was signing an executive order for uh, a business plan for, or I forget how he put it, but anyway, they're a, a task force to look into the viability of a state-owned bank for New Jersey. For New Jersey. So, we have quite a few things going on, and uh, what really interests me at the moment is the federal level, that if, if we could set up a network that was, if we could have that deep pocket from the top, we could, we could do whatever we, I mean, you know, we can have abundance of the sort we imagine. How likely is that? I mean, given, given what's going on in Washington these days, how likely is it that Congress will? Well, uh, we would no doubt need a, I don't even want to say a different president. I, I mean, I think it can be done. I, well, I don't know. I, I do tend to be an optimist. But I mean, what can you do but, but push for, for what you think would work? And like, it's taken 10 years to get this far with public banks, but it's gotten to be where people know what we're talking about now. And it's, you know, their politicians are asking for it. I was just in South Korea, and they and doing a... I gave a keynote speak at a speech at a conference, and 
they were all set to do it because they already knew what public banks were. Anyway, it just seems to me that um, it's the first thing you have to do is education. And like there, I saw that little video, that movie last night. When there was one line in it where somebody said, "It's um, we only hear about austerity. You know, we have to tighten our belts. We're going to have to give up this and give up that. But let's focus on all the things we'll get. Like we'll get t tasty food, healthy bodies, um, clean air. You know, just all the." When people realize that we can have all those things, and it's not really, it, it, it really won't cost anything except re-educating the farmers. I mean, once they realize that, that they can make more money doing it, that, that's what my understanding. You all know more than I do, I think, on that. But anyway, that's what I'm learning from this conference, that, that uh, you know, this is really a great thing, and we just have to get that information out there that it's affordable, it'll fix the problem, we don't have to bump up against the oil companies. I mean, not that I'm saying I want to promote the oil companies. It just looks, it's to me, it's like bumping up against Wall Street. Your better option is just to set up a better mousetrap and then, and then people just gravitate over toward it because it works better instead of, you know, always trying to fight them in, in Congress. Thank you. Thank you.